As stated previously more than once, this world, that I nickname the House of Mirrors, is a place necessarily immersed in scripts. I say necessarily because the observer requires stories to realize all about its own potentials. Naturally, scripts require characters to be played out, and this is the reason why we generate and wear characters to place on the soul's throne room, also known as the ego. Ideally, these characters are genuine and authentic, and will therefore have a birthright, so to speak, to sit on the throne for a period of time during the narrative of that soul. However, it is fairly evident that many of the characters will disconnect from their role and focus instead on continuance, that is, on survival retaining its attributes and memories, unchanged. When that happens, the metaphorical soul's kingdom falls into disgrace as it follows its king in his dark floundering. Sort of like King Arthur's myth, when he loses Excalibur. A steward character must then be hastily found to be a placeholder, while a new authentic character is generated. Even then, the steward may fall victim of the same curse and refuse to abandon in favor of a genuine king character. Note that I am still talking metaphorically in the individual soul. Survival in the material sense is quite a painful and dense issue, compact and heavy as it is. But survival is treated exactly in the same way by mental characters and personas that would not be subject to the same level of weight as a material death. Why? Because the characters believe they are the self, and, even more disquieting, the self believes it is the character. Identification, also previously addressed in a contemplation named Identification and Expectation, is the core of the issue here, of course, or, to be precise, false identification is. So, a character whose useful and prominent role has expired, in a soul's individual point of view of a narrative, may then become attached to remaining there, fed and helped by the soul's identification with it. Past the window of opportunity, in which the character may leave the stage under a standing ovation and with flowers thrown at his feet as appreciation for his glorious performance where he fit perfectly, the shadow of itself, that is, the reflection of his inadequacy in the continuation past his destined point in the soul's observational journey, will continually grow until, if still unheeded, it explodes. And if so, the character is then instead dragged out of the stage, yelling, cursing and screaming, or sobbing and moaning, depending on where it was on the scale of the duality of pride and shame, while being booed by everyone in attendance. I used to say that the shadow is like a very, very persistent and determined mailman. He will only leave after you read the message. So, a character who leaves at his right time will leave in glory and be remembered fondly by those other who knew it. One who leaves forcefully at the hands of its own reflection will be at best forgotten and at worst a lasting symbol of undesirability. I will take the chance now to note again something that had previously also been discussed but that it is, in my individual view, of the utmost importance to bear in mind. 1. The purpose of the narratives are observation by the self. 2. This self or essence projects its individual narratives onto the collective narratives through the soul or ego, that I also metaphorically nickname throne room, so that it can realize its potentials through limitations, because it has none otherwise, so it can't know itself only exist as an unlimited entity. 3. As the essence projects through the soul or ego, it generates necessary characters, grown from habit, from external stimuli, 
and from internal preset tendencies. So when seen like this, it must be then understood that although a mental character is not a organic, living, independent entity as the essence is, it is performing an incalculable service to the essence by existing in the narratives because the essence can't otherwise observe them and itself. So it must be realized that the character is loved by a grateful essence even when it fails or falls, exactly because it is a limited point of view of an otherwise unlimited entity. And its failings reveal more of itself to the observing essence than its successes. After all, do we, seekers, not learn more from our mistakes that have hurt others than from the mistakes of others that have hurt us? At least in my individual observation, it is so. This all said, we finally come to the core of the subject that titled this contemplation. Often, we find ourselves, or better said, our characters, again, remember, created from habit and preset tendencies, in our individual narratives, faced with a period of either unease or what would be called a rotten piece. Metaphorically, something smells and we don't know where it comes from. At these moments, the messages within the narrative, through synchronicities and other means, intensify. This is because the essence is trying to, lovingly, guide the character to take the next step. It is usually an uncomfortable step, and the more uncomfortable it becomes, the more it is delayed. Because it usually means that the present character must leave the stage, that is, it must die for the narrative. If it voluntarily does so and moves on, it will live on in the memory world of its loving essence. If it holds on until it is consumed by its own reflections or shadows, then, well, then it won't at least. At these times, it is essential to be more observant than usual and to actually force, if needed, one's character to take that ominous step that is growingly obvious whatever it is in one's individual narrative, even if it is done while the character complains and holds back and uses all kinds of tricks to postpone it further. The character will thank you afterwards for the courage, absolutely, instead of bemoaning its bad luck until it is eaten away like a tumor. Please refer to the contemplation named Metaphors of Tumors. What lies beyond these necessary steps, after the dust is settled on the passing of the previous character, and if the mental character passed on within the window of opportunity and voluntarily, there won't be much dust floating around anyway, will fit much better than before, because a new, genuine and rightful character has sat on the throne or the soul or ego. There are mythical situations patterns that need to be observed by each of our essences at certain points, and these are far stronger than even its own will, when falsely identified with a character. So, be careful if you are tempted to call these points as God's will, because it may very well be that it is that will that stands in the way, and it is the small character, the small hobbit, metaphorically speaking, of course, that bears the burden of taking the necessary step that all others thought it was crazy. In tarot terms, the character must risk becoming a fool and go through death to avoid being cast down like the tower and to then find its own star.